All right, hello everyone. Thank you all for joining us today. Welcome to this webinar on critical assessments of contemporary leadership in the Philippines. This webinar is jointly organized by the Academic Council and the United Nations System or ACON's Tokyo Liaison Office, the Global Peacebuilding Association of Japan or GPAJ, and the Network for Education and Research on Peace and Sustainability or NERPS here at Hiroshima University. My name is Dalia Simangan, Assistant Professor at Hiroshima University, and I'm very, very happy to be one of your moderators for today's webinar. To start, I'd like to invite the director of Aiken Tokyo and the president of GPAJ, Professor Sukehiro Hasegawa, for his welcome remarks. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Daria Simangan. Uh, thank you uh, for your introduction. The international community has been observing very carefully how the President uh, Duterte has been managing Philippines domestic as well as uh, international affairs. United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights has been uh, critical of uh, President Duterte's uh, strongman's approach in uh, dealing with the crimes associated with uh, illegal drugs and uh, even uh, terrorist uh, acts. Yet, I, and I understand that uh, President Duterte has a rather high approving rating in the public opinion in the Philippines. Today, I'm glad to know that uh, prominent professors will diagnose uh, the contemporary issues and provide us with uh, insightful understanding of the controversial political leader, President Duterte, and his political and the security approach. As a foreigner to the Philippines, I am also interested in the analysis of uh, Duterte's foreign policy as well as domest domestic policy, particularly the Philippines' relationship with China and the United States. So thank you again for inviting me for this very significant uh, uh, political debate, as well as academic uh, uh, analysis of the Philippines' uh, contemporary issues. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Hasegawa. Before I introduce our first speaker, I'd like to inform our attendees that you can type in your questions anytime in the chat box during this webinar. And we have already received uh, several questions during the registration. Um, and so thank you for that. And we'll try to raise as many questions as our remaining time will allow later. For our first speaker, I'm honored to introduce a distinguished professor of political science at the University of the Philippines, Diliman, and the head of the Asia Pacific Institute for Climate Change Mitigation and Adaptation Foundation, as well as the Strat Search Foundation, among her many other positions, past and present. She's also teaching graduate courses in elite politics. She's well known to many of us for her intellectual contributions to foreign policy, defense and security, geopolitics, and climate change. It's my pleasure to welcome Professor Clarita Carlos. Thank you, Professor Carlos. Thank you, uh, Professor Simangan. Um, what I have prepared today are really broad strokes of how to assess uh, political leadership, uh, a particular kind of uh, political leader who is still, who still has 400 days uh, in his political life. Um, I wrote my PhD dissertation on two political leaders in the Philippines, President Marcos and President Magsaysay. At the time, Marcos was ailing already and Magsaysay had long been dead from an airplane crash. And so how am I going to investigate these two political leaders? I did it from a distance using political psychological framework of measuring motives. That's how I started uh, my interest, particularly focusing on political leadership. So today, what I'm going to share uh, in this seminar, uh, together with your other guests and my colleagues here, Professor Tehanki and Professor uh, Corato, would be two basic points. 
The first is one of the best ways of assessing political leaders called the operational code construct. And the second one would be related to a book I had written several years back called Democratic Deficits in the Philippines. So essentially, I'm going to give you the broad outline of how are you going to assess a political leader given a construct which may attempt to explain, maybe somehow in a limited way, predict the way he is going to uh, act or going to decide on certain events, whether they are domestic or foreign. Given the limited time I have, I can only give you the highlights. And please take note, we are talking of leadership, which is in process, which is active. Therefore, whatever assessments each of us as scholars will make of him are tentative. And they, are, they will have to wait for when data will be available. Uh, and they will need to wait for um, integrated and holistic way of looking at the political leader. So I'm giving all these caveats because I'm sure we will get a lot of flack later on in regard to, you know, why are you assessing Duterte like that? So they are tentative and they are exploratory in the absence of any deep and broad analysis of President Duterte. Okay, what is the operational code? 70 years ago, a scholar named Nathan Leitis tried to understand the Politburo of the Soviet Union. And what he used was what is now known as the operational code construct. It is something like a prism, an ischema, if you want, so that you're viewing the political leader from the point of view of two kinds of belief perspectives. One is the core beliefs, what we call philosophical beliefs, and the other is what is called instrumental belief. In other words, on the basis of these beliefs, these values, their orientations and attitudes, how is a leader going to act on certain events or certain um, uh, things happening around him in the domestic sphere and in international sphere? What are the components of an operational code? Basically, I will just give you some of them. I'll not give the whole list um, because of our time constraint. And these are some of the questions that may be asked. Is the leader basically uh, a high risk taker or a low risk taker? Is he an optimist or is he a pessimist? Does he think of the political environment as one of harmony or as one of conflict? And how does he view his opponents? Does he think that he can shape the future or does he think that the future is predictable or is he just going to wing it and go with the tide? And what is the role of chance in historical development? Now, given this basic values and belief the system, the leader now uses this as a prism, an eschema, if you wish, and so he now makes decisions on a day-to-day -day basis, on a medium-term basis, and a long-term basis within his political tenure of 2,000 days. Okay, note, I have not done any analysis of President Duterte. The things I'm going to share here with you would be based on things which I read about him. I have met him only once when we were tandem in one, uh, uh, what was this? I think it was an anniversary of the professional regulatory group. And I presented my, uh, uh, my speech first before he did. And so, but of course, I did not get to talk to him. So whatever it is I'm going to share with you here would be on the basis of this extant materials. Nothing deep, nothing broad, but they're simply, you know, highlights of what I think, my sense, as a scholar of political leadership of who he is and what he has demonstrated to us thus far. First, let us look at the constraints to rational decision-making of all political leaders for that matter, not just, not, not just Duterte. The first constraint everybody knows is the level of information available to him. So the more information available to him, the better is going to make a decision. The number two is 
his innate in, um, inadequacy of relationships between things, particularly in foreign policy. Okay. And number three would be his difficulty in deciding which is the best option, the best alternative courses of action, particularly in a crisis situation where he has a short period, there's a high threat situation, and he has very little information. So these are some of the constraints of decision-making for all political leaders for that matter. Now, I forgot to raise the question, why are we studying them? I mean, why are we not studying the one, you know, selling tofu in the street or an actress or an actor? Well, we're studying them because a political leader, whether it is one person, a military junta or, you know, a collective, they have the power to commit the resources of the country. Not only do they have the power to commit the resources, they decide the agenda and they decide the priority. So this, this is the reason why we talk about them. This is the reason why we study them because we are attempting to explain why and how they decide. And we're also attempting to exclude leaders in the future who might have the attributes of things which we do not accept and which are not desirable to us. And that's the reason why we're studying political leadership. This is not yet uh, you know, a developed field. As um, uh, Professor Simangan had noted, there is only one course in our curriculum in political science here in the university called Elites in Politics. And I have taught that course several times. And that <laughs> course, I like it because it's very active because every time, you know, even while you have a basic syllabus, you really ask different questions every term. Okay, let's cut to the chase. And here is my analysis of who Duterte is thus far, given all the caveats that I have identified. Duterte thinks of the political environment as basically that of conflict rather than harmony. His enemies are those whom he perceived to oppose his views. And I can sense a modicum of vengefulness in him. I may be corrected by later investigations of scholars, but right now I can sense that vengefulness and we can cite anecdotal evidence which we will not go into. Then I noted that he has a guarded optimism about things and a conditional pessimism. Uh, look at the way he uh, deals with China. He is saying he's walking on a tightrope. And he has mentioned that several times in different ways. Walking on a tightrope, meaning, you know, balancing the US and uh, 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 Chinese interests and trying to figure out, you know, how best we're going to locate ourselves given these two superpowers. Now, I noted too that the president has a way of just accepting the political environment. I don't see him taking a, like a trailblazing role as one who, will, who would like to shape the environment. Look at the time we were chair of the ASEAN. It was uh, ho home, you know, I thought he was going to really make waves there. And I said, I don't know how many times he mentioned regional integration, which is really the core of ASEAN. I think he mentioned it like twice, you know. And, um, and that is one of the reasons why I believe that Duterte is just interested in, you know, well, finishing his term, but not really in sh actively shaping and actively taking an, um, a, a role, a participant role to take a lead. And I have seen that in the ASEAN uh, participation. Do you think he's a strategist? He is. Many people are saying, and some pundits are saying that he doesn't have a strategy. Everyone has a strategy. You only need to find out what they are. You know, it's like saying, I can't study Muammar Gaddafi or you know, Saddam Hussein. You can study them. You just need to see, look at the pattern. So he has a strategy. And his strategy, if you want to get a quick and dirty word, would be pragmatism. Pragmatism is the name of the game insofar as he is concerned. He knows the military power of China, 
And while people saw it as a, like a lame uh, expression of, no, we can't do anything about China, he's saying, okay, you want to fight with China? I mean, can we please count how many tanks we have, you know, airplanes which are falling all the time and the like. And so he says, no, we are going to live with China and this is the way to do it. Get as much from China, as much loans, infrastructure, support for the Belt and Road, and at the same time, get the same with the United States. I'm sure he's, the CISOing uh, RPUS relations is so, so pronounced, you know, withdraw BFA, backpedal on the BFA and the like. The pragmatism is so pronounced, but at the same time, the lack of a medium to long-term um, vision is also there. As I said, I need, we need more critical analysis and more data on this before we can make some fairly um, good descriptions of this pragmatic nature of President Duterte. Also, in regard to foreign policy, you will also notice that he is a very low risk taker. I compare this to President Marcos. You know, of course, let's not compare the number of years they've been there, but President Marcos is a very high risk taker, and President Marcos knows he can shape history. In fact, you know, during the time Marcos uh, would uh, talk in the ASEAN or in any regional organizations, nobody speaks. Even Lee Kuan Yew cannot speak, you know. Uh, that's how powerful he was. And that's how he thought that history cannot just be accepted, but can be shaped and can be controlled. And Duterte is on the opposite side of that pendulum. So Marcos is on that pole and Duterte is on the other pole. It's just winging it if you want to be, uh, charitable about it. Okay, I already mentioned to you that at the time we were the chair of the ASEAN, there was very little appreciation of ASEAN regional integration. And Duterte did not see himself as an active actor that may shape ASEAN future. And you can see it now, even now. I mean, suppose in 2025, we're supposed to have one ASEAN army, Marines, you know, Air Force, uh, Navy. Are we talking about it? I think I'm the only one talking about this 2025 target of ASEAN defense and security community. Okay, let me go to the second part now. Um, I'm not looking at the time, but um, I think I, uh, I'm still good. Uh, yeah, you know, you just give me the sign to just shut up, uh, Dahlia. Okay, the second one is, uh, as I have noted, First, we look at one of the best assessments. I say best assessment because if you look at the PhD dissertations now, and you can Google it later after this program, you will see so many, many titles called the operational code of Vladimir Putin, the operational code of Tony Blair, et cetera. In other words, if PhD students, and they need not be the students of Alexander George of Stanford University, who also spearheaded this, if they're using it and they're using it fre frequently, to explain political leaders, that means it matters, isn't it? Otherwise, you will just drop it because it has very little explanatory value and explanatory appeal. The fact that you keep on using it means that it can be really used as a prism through which you review political leadership. Now, let us locate Duterte now within what I call the democratic deficit, which is really the title of my book, Democratic Deficits. So Duterte located himself in a political environment where the political parties were so broken. You know, in fact, he had to put together his own political party where, you know, political party members are just jumping from one party to another, changing their political color and not committing political suicide in the process. But what Duterte did not pursue, and this is really one lost opportunity, is that he had uh, what we call a, a super majority in both houses. And yet, you know, during his campaign, the, the focal point of his campaign was shift from unitary to federal constitutional reform. Did they push it? No, unfortunately. And you will see this also in the way he deals with his department secretaries, his cabinet members. Uh, if I may use an uncharitable term, it's just, he just let them go, you know, and, um, you know, do whatever you want, given the mandate of your office, da, da, da. And unless they're really like super corrupt and super inept or super incompetent, that's the only time he's going to move, if at all. So it's the same thing here. He thought, you know, just declaring that I want a federal system that it will implement itself. It did not implement itself, you know. 
And we have some, I'm sure, tragic comedies in terms of how to sell the federal uh, system using, uh, you know, let's not go there anymore. Okay. Um, the way he dealt with drugs. Um, I look at that. I'm looking for an, um, an explanation, a potential, um, a probable explanation for how he, how he used draconian measures to deal with drugs and uh, the um, continuing accusations of extrajudicial killings. And I think he did that because it is very well known how he dealt with drugs and other crimes in Davao. And the joke is that, well, you know, everybody's dead in Davao, that those who are not dead, they went to other cities. And that's not a joke, by the way, it's pregnant with meaning. Okay. All right, so um, maybe to wrap it up, let me just say that I have noted here my own reading of the operational code of President uh, Duterte. First, he thinks that history cannot be shaped, that the political environment is one of conflict and not of harmony, and that he is guardedly optimistic about things, that he is a fairly low risk taker, and he thinks it cannot shape the future. And yes, his pragmatism will take the form of retreating before what he perceives to be a superior force, yielding to an opponent in the meanwhile, and taking the time until such time when he would be in a position of strength. You know, we can stretch pragmatism that way. You know, wait for a time, you shut up in the meanwhile, and then, you know, start talking when you have a bigger stick. And because he is a law risk taker, he will not play a high stakes game. Okay, what's the utility of the operational code? Just to conclude my presentation. You know, the operational code, when you score them separately, doesn't tell you anything. It's not even explanatory framework or a platform. What you need to do and what scholars need to do is really to stitch together, you know, all the questions that are asked in the instrumental belief system and in the philosophical belief system and come out with a holistic assessment based on the operational code. And that is not a standalone. The operational code is only one of the assessments and you have to integrate it with other modes of assessment. You have, so you have a whole reading of, or an approximation of who President Duterte is, but that will have to wait. And to conclude, thank you very much for inviting me to this seminar. Thank you very much, Professor Carlos. Thank you so much for providing us an overview of the characteristics of Duterte as a leader in the Philippines and also as a leader in the region. And also thank you for reminding us of this exp explanatory value of the operational code when we assess political leadership, such as that of Duterte. So, Thank you for that. Our second speaker is a leading political analyst in the Philippines. He's a professor and the chair of political science department at the De La Salle University in Manila. He served as the president of the Philippine Political Science Association and the Asian Political and International Studies Association. He was also a distinguished visiting research scholar at the Center for Southeast Asian Studies at Kyoto University, among his many leadership roles and distinctions. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Julio Tehang. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon to everyone. Uh, let me share my screen. Uh, good afternoon. I would like to thank uh, the Academic Council of the United Nations Systems, or ACUS, uh, Tokyo Li Liaison Office, the Global Peace Building Association and the Network for Education, Research and Peace for organizing this timely webinar. Special shout out to Dalia Simangan of Hiroshima University and Raymond Andaya of the University of Tokyo for inviting me to deliver this afternoon's presentation. I'm also deeply honored to share this webinar with my UP graduate professor, Clarita Carlos, and my brilliant friend and colleague, Nicole Corato. This presentation is largely extracted from a draft book manuscript I'm co-authoring with Professor Mark Thompson of the City University of Hong Kong. The Philippine presidency 
is the first and most durable in Asia. As a form of government, uh, presidentialism tends to personalize the chief executive more than in a parliamentary system, where in theory, at least, the prime minister is simply the voice of the collective leadership in parliament. In the Philippines, political leadership is concentrated in the presidency. As a political institution, the Philippine presidency has been rendered enough constitutional power to have a formal semblance of a strong presidency. While the Philippine presidency is patterned after the American template, in fact, it is rooted in Latin American practices. Historically, the modern Philippine presidency was patterned after the Spanish and then later the American governor general. Hence, the Philippine presidency has traditionally been accorded more coercive powers and fiscal prerogatives than its American counterpart. As historian Alfred McCoy noted, there is a strong tradition of strong presidency in the Philippines, reflected by strongmen presidents in the, in the person of Manuel Quezon, Ferdinand Marcos, and Rodrigo Duterte. However, this view of a strong presidency in a weak state raises the puzzle of why presidents are apparently not strong enough to totally control strategic interests in Philippine society. The state is captured by particularistic interests, but the presidency is structurally strong. Another major puzzle that is, that is not all Philippine presidents have been equally strong. Some have been vulnerable to serious elite military challenges, with one post-Marcos president being ousted and two other face repeated coup attempts by disgruntled military elements backed by key politicians, business and religious leaders, and civil society activists. Now, before we attempt to address these two puzzles, let us review the literature on the Philippine presidency and presidential leadership. Traditionally, there have been two most influential theories of the Philippine presidency. The first is an actor-centered strongman presidential style perspective popularized by the late eminent Filipino political scientist, Remio Agpalo. Agpalo highlighted the role of the presidential leadership by emphasizing the supremacy of the executive in what he termed as the Pangulo regime. Growing largely from cultural notions and communitarian ideals, Agpalo placed premium on the value of pagdamay, or sharing and caring for other people. The Pangulo serves as an appropriate metaphor for the body politics such that in the Filipino saying, ang sakit ng kalingkinan ay damdam ng buong katawan. Hence, the body politic is literally an organic body of politics. The pain suffered by the little finger is felt by the whole body. Hence, the Pangulo is the pinakaulo, or literally the head of the state. Agpalo saw the realization of his Pangulo regime in the authoritarian regime of Ferdinand Marcos. The other influential perspective in the Philippine presidency is that of the structuralist patron-in-chief approach. The view of the president as a patron-in-chief, which is derived from the larger literature about Philippine politics, is conducted primarily on the basis of clientelistic links between voters and politicians and patronage distribution among the politicians themselves. Carl H. Lande, an American political scientist in the 1960s, was the first to describe the patron-client ties that define politics in the Philippines. The patron-client factional model has long dominated the literature on Philippine political science. For Japanese political scientist Yuko Kasuya, 
the Philippine president is the key figure who controls the legislature's uh, pork barreling through his or her control of the budget execution processes. The president's control of the pork budget creates the logic of party system formation, which she called presidential bandwagon, or incumbents who won the presidential election year by affiliating with various parties switch to the president's party by the time of the midterm election. For Antonio Contreras, the maven of Philippine postmodernism, there seems to be a dissonance in a society that is inherently communitarian, where ideally collective interest prevails over individual interests, but also has a tendency to engage in political idolatry. From his postmodernist deconstruction of Philippine politics, Contreras asserts that in the absence of the grand text to define the Filipinos, in which the state was a, a colonial construct and the nation is an unfinished product, communities form from personal affinities based on the concept of pakikipagkapwa. Hence, for Contreras, political order, therefore, is not really about building political institutions based on Western notions and ideals, but a form of pagsasaayos or putting the house in order. He agrees with Agpalo that a Pangulo emerges to become the core of a personality cult that nurtures political ideology. In fact, he argues that Duterte himself has become the ideology, or what other academics would call Dutertismo. He also believes Rodrigo Duterte to be that Pangulo, but in the end, he decries the polarization and partisanship that have resulted in the erosion of the kapwa, or pakikipagkapwa, under Duterte's uh, administration. In a forthcoming book that I co-authored with Mark Thompson, we argue for a relational theory of presidential regimes situated in political time, adapted from Stephen Skoronek's study of the U.S. presidency, and we provide a more differentiated account of presidential strength and vulnerability in the Philippines within a weak state. We also adopt Anthony Giddens' concept of structuration, in which human action is shaped by social structures, which are products of human actions. To paraphrase Karl Marx, presidents act, but not in any way they choose. From the perspective of political time, presidential performance is not based solely on personal qualities or policy initiatives, but rather on the sequencing of presidency within political time. A coalition of interests within particular institutional contexts, presidents find themselves facing different obstacles to leadership based on their relations to an existing regime. So a president may be uh, affiliated or opposed to an existing dominant regime. And based on their affiliation or their opposition to this regime, they can either be vulnerable or resilient based on the strength or weakness of that regime. And in the Philippines, the presidency can be a prequel or a sequel to an ongoing political narrative. Given the absence of ideological contestation and programmatic political parties in the country, we speak of political narratives as the stories presidents tell. These narratives serve to coalesce support from the dominant strategic interest groups whose backing can make or break the presidency. For example, the most dominant 
political narrative in the post edsa post marcos period is that of the narrative of liberal reformism by battling the evils of corruption liberal reformists often make claims of the good in their crusade for good governance this is what japanese anthropologist wataru kusaka termed as moral politics by enduring personal sacrifices at the hands of the corrupt officials liberal reformists are worthy of the public's trust their storyline is that i will help you because i am morally good honesty sincerity are their code, code words populists on the other hand are the main challengers to the narrative of liberal reformism in the philippines populism or populists usually make class appeals and claim to champion the poor minus the ideology they decry the hypocrisy of the elites corruption is a non issue for them since their archetypical image is that of robin hood i will fight for you because i am one of you masa mahirap are their cold words we also assert that philippine presidents govern in accordance with or in opposition to an existential political configuration or regime consisting of a prevailing political narrative powerful elite strategic groups and key state institutions where a president finds her or himself in political time the stage in the life cycle of a political configuration strongly influences how strong or endangered their presidency proves to be within a weak state malleable to presidential whim but also susceptible to societal pressure determining whether democratic norms or undermine so in most instances of a uh, crisis of presidential leadership uh, what is at stake is not simply the survival of a presidency but also the survival of democracy presidents have been strong when they have a clear political narrative and the support of powerful strategic groups including the catholic church business oligarchs and civil society activists as well as the blessing of or criticism by foreign powers particularly the united states and more recently increasingly by china which may strengthen or weaken societal challenges thus strong a strong philippine president acting as a patron in chief can dominate a weak state through limited horizontal accountability to other branches of government and because of weak parties a lack of strong vertical accountability as well but the relative autonomy of the strategic groups in the state particularly the military limits how much control the president may ultimately be able to exercise over the state apparatus itself a narrative a narrative trap of course when a governing script stories diverges too dramatically from political reality resulting in a loss of support or even severe antagonism from the critical strategic groups in the country for example after two decades in power the ironclad grip of the dictator ferdinand marcos was gradually eroded by the sight of a sick and feeble husk of a strong man who failed in his promise to make this country great again and instead rub it blind the country's first populist president joseph estrada closely identified with the poor with his slogan era para sa mahira or era for the poor but failed to win the support of the most critical strategic groups the traditional big business and the catholic church and eventually lost the support of the military and key civil society groups triggered by a series of corruption scandals both were ousted in people power uprisings 
Gloria Macapagal Arroyo's narrative of building a strong republic was undermined by accusations of electoral fraud and major corruption scandals. She became, in terms of popular uh, teleserie, drama, the contrabida of Philippine politics. The villain, full of pride, greed, but she survived her tumultuous term in office through free-flowing patronage, proficient management of the economy, and adept handling of crisis situations. Now, some presidents have proven susceptible to societal challenges when their discourse or their narrative has become discredited or strategic elites have turned against them and they have lost control of the military and even Congress and the courts turn against them. Even when a president is personally popular, if located in the wrong place in political time, the dominant political order may prove disjunctive, leading to a change in a political order. This is what we call imperiled presidents. Imperiled presidents have either had their political narrative discredited, making them highly unpopular, or losing them, or losing the support of the key strategic interests, like the business sector, the Catholic Church bishops, key activists, and even the military. Now, this is exactly uh, the thing that happened uh, in the Philippines. No? Duterte's electoral victory is a major rupture in the post-Marcos EDSA regime founded by Corazon Cory Aquino in 1986. The failure of the liberal reformist political order to implement much needed social and political reforms and strengthen state capacity, most not not noticeably uh, in the criminal justice system and disaster management, fueled a politics of anger that Duterte was able to tap during the, nine, the 2016 presidential election. A strong president that exercises control over the military may be tempted to be transgressive. No? These are illiberal intentions no? uh, that removes even the limited constraints on presidential power, both nationally and locally. This is the other half of the uh, equation that we are proposing. Presidents can be imperial, but presidents can also be imperious. Imperious presidents often use their massive patronage resources and control of the bureaucracy to overrun limited legislative and legal constraints, further weakening or even threatening, if not destroying democracy. Since his election in 2016, President Duterte has transacted primarily in two, with two populist currencies, fear and performance. Fear is characterized but by what uh, our colleague uh, Nicole Corato uh, mentioned as penal populism. A political style that builds on collective sentiments of fear and demands for punitive politics. Performance is what Benjamin uh, uh, Moffitt term as per performative populism, a style of populism uh, in the age of television and digital media that draws a repertoire of performances. But just like his predecessor, Duterte is now facing his own narrative trap. Ironically, just like Noynay Aquino, he scored a major victory in the midterm elections and has enjoyed sustained popularity and high approval ratings in the surveys. And similarly, he is at the point in his term where he is faced with a crisis situation that threatens the legacy of his administration the COVID-19 pandemic. With presidential elections scheduled for 2022, 
either populism in office turns out to be feeble, in which case it will soon be forced back into opposition, or it proves to be strong enough to consolidate power and start a new narrative, a new configuration, and a new regime. Only time will tell whether Duterte's handling of the COVID-19 crisis will fully repudiate the EDSA narrative, or he will be another failed populist challenger. Given the uncertainties brought about by the COVID-19 crisis and its possible threat to social order in the aftermath, it just might be easier for Duterte to wield the iron fist of an imperious presidency. But he must heed the lessons of history. Viewed from the perspective of political time, past presidents who transgressed their presidential powers have done so with great political risk, even at the cost of their presidency. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Maraming salamat po sa inyong lahat. Maraming salamat, Professor Tihanki. Thank you for walking us through the history of the development of state institutions in the Philippines and the cultural uh, idiosyncrasies that shape not only these is, this institutions, but also the way our leaders govern the country, often leading toward, as you put it, um, a strong presidency in a weak state. So thank you for that. Now to kick off our discussion, I'd like to invite one of our country's leading sociologists known to many of us as well. She's an associate professor at the Center for Deliberative Democracy and Global Governance at the University of Canberra in Australia. She has authored many uh, works, pieces, but most relevant to this webinar is her book, a Democracy in a Time of Misery, published by the Oxford University Press and an edited collection, a Duterte reader published by the Ateneo de Manila University Press. Join me in welcoming Dr. Nicole Torato. Yes, hello Dahlia and hello everybody. Thank you to Dahlia and Raymond for organizing this meaningful discussion on a Friday afternoon. Um, it's a shame we cannot discuss our ideas further in an izakaya as I'm sure our colleagues watching this webinar have a lot of ideas and questions stemming from Professor Carlos and Professor Tihanki's talks. I have more than 3,000 words of notes in my laptop, so let me just try to condense this with, um, yeah, I'm going to structure my comments as a discussant around three striking ideas that I learned from our previous speakers and ask some questions that hopefully um, stimulate the discussion in the next few minutes. So let's get started. So my first comment relates to the understanding of political leadership in relation to the operational code, as Professor Carlos explained. And of course, the operational code is one of many ways of assessing a political leader, as Professor Carlos reminds us. And I really like that we are cautioned to appreciate our observations as tentative until we have sufficient data. That said, I find this, uh, I find this idea useful. To understand a political leader, we need to understand how he or she sees the political environment. Is it built on harmony or is it built on conflict? And clearly President Duterte sees the world through the lens of conflict. He portrays the Philippines in rather dystopian terms. He described the Philippines as a narco state on the brink of fragmentation. And this narrative is critical to justify his drug war. And of course, narratives are not just stories. They're not just speeches or anecdotes. Narratives have political power and they are real in consequences. So seeing the world in conflictual terms justifies coercion rather than appealing to people's sense of collaboration and compassion. So obviously the brute force used in the drug war has become not just a normalized way of approaching or securitizing an otherwise public health related issue, but it, the logic of the drug war of seeing the world in conflictual terms has become the organizing logic of the Duterte regime. And I think when we reflect on how uh, the Duterte regime um, governed the pandemic, we can see this worldview very much pronounced in COVID-19 policies. Um, studies around the world so far ask the question, 
why is there compliance to COVID-related policies, given that a lot of these policies are unenforceable, right? So it's hard to enforce curfew because states don't have that big militaries and police. How can we enforce social distancing? It's almost impossible to enforce. So why do people follow anyway? And a lot of the sociological studies find um, that it's because COVID rules or compliance to COVID rules are built on norms of voluntary abidance and willing self-regulation. So it's normative rather than instrumental. So this made me reflect on COVID, um, COVID response in the Philippines with a worldview that the world is conflictual, the response has been coercive and militarized instead of appealing to the people's solidaristic behavior, harmonious behavior that often emerges in the aftermath of the crisis. And I think that is one uh, missed opportunity in the Philippines COVID response. We have a culture of disaster. We are a country that is so used to responding to crises that are bigger than individuals. And yet the first, um, the first instinct is to pathologize Filipinos as pasaway, to pathologize Filipinos as um, disobedient, because precisely because the worldview is built on a conflictual um, perspective rather than appreciating the history of the country as a culture of disaster that is a culture of mutual support. But I also appreciate that this is not always the case. So reflecting on Professor Tihanki's talk, he mentioned the Pangulo regime, which emphasizes the reverse, the pagdamay, or the solidaristic view of the body politic. But we also know that these appeals to harmony can be interpreted as justification to authoritarianism of deference to political leaders for the health of the entire um, country. And I assume the concept of President Arroyo's strong republic can also build on this. It, it builds on the narrative of the country pulling together but it also has an expectation for, for its citizens to look the other way when there are corruption scandals or abuses in power. I think we can also classify leaders who believe in patronage or practice patronage as leaders who also see a harmonious view of the world that the poor um, should stay in their place, that they will receive the care and compassion of powerful elites, that their transactions will be governed by moral politics as Professor Tihanki puts it, so what am I trying to say here? I think what I'm trying to say is that the discourse or the worldview of both harmony and conflict can both be used for authoritarian or illiberal ends. A conflictual view of the world as we see in the Duterte regime can be used to justify a militaristic or, or securitized heavily coercive approach to governance, but a harmonious approach to politics can also be used as a justification to maintain existing social relations, existing social hierarchies and dependencies of the poor uh, with the elites. So I think my question now is, how can we democratize these worldviews? Can we think of political leaders who successfully translate their worldviews to democratic practice? So that is the first idea. The second idea that I find particularly striking is how Professor Carlos described President Duterte as a low risk taker. I found that striking in the first instance because uh, sorry, President Duterte is always described as a maverick, someone who threw the rule book out of the window, uh, but now, or a disruptor even, but now I understand. Um, if we look at the precise policies that President Duterte took, for example, uh, the example Professor Carlos gave us is his leadership in the ASEAN, it definitely demonstrates he is actually a, a low risk taker. He has no interest in reshaping uh, particular social relations based on a certain uh, worldview. And we also understand this comment in relation to Professor Tihanghi's comments. I mean, it makes more sense. I mean, how much risks can President Duterte take if our political system is captured by elite interest? How much risk can a president take if the state only has limited autonomy? To what extent are risk calculations constrained by the broader political structure? So I guess my question here is, how much agency can we actually expect from our political leaders, considering all the historical and political structural constraints that Professor Tihanki talked about? And I think the answer to that question also comes from Professor Tihanki's talk. Um, yes, leaders can also be high risk takers. Presidents can be, as he puts it, imperiled or imperious. And there are indeed po possibilities for President Duterte to repudiate the narrative of liberal democracy. But the question, as Professor Tihanki puts it, is can he learn from history? And this is where I think the, um, where he faces a fork in the road. 
how much of a risk taker will he be towards the end of his regime? And what lessons from history will he take with him in order to ensure that he doesn't suffer the same, suffer the same fate as previous presidents who took risks? That's the second point. Um, the final question is very short, and I want to ask our speakers to characterize the people in the context of the leader, because I assume that the relationship of the people and the leader is mutually constitutive. So I wonder how we can think about how leaders also uh, shift the shape of their rep representation and the political claims and response to the public's need. I wonder how our insights on political leadership can also give us insight on citizenship and how political leadership styles, worldviews, and um, practices map on to practices of citizenship in an increasingly heterogeneous, in an increasingly dynamic citizenry that the Philippines has today. So I will end my comments there and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Nicole, for this um, excellent synthesis and so much to rethink and, deli uh, and deliberate from your reflection and questions about the pitfalls and potentials of narratives of harmony and conflict in the, in the Philippines. And before we invite again our speakers to respond, I'd like to ask my colleague at Aikens Tokyo, a PhD student at the University of Tokyo, and very uh, key in making this event happen, Mr. Raymond and Daya, to moderate this Q&A session. On to you, Raymond. Thank you, thank you, Dalia Sensei. And perhaps um, can we spend about maybe five to ten minutes just for uh, Professor Carlos and Professor Tihanki to respond to uh, Professor Curato's uh, comments, uh, two general comments about the the presentation. Can we start with uh, Dr. Carlos, please? Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Nicole, for your. Uh reactions to my and uh, Professor Tihanki's uh, presentation. Indeed, um, as I continue to note uh, the data that may eventually come out um, would demolish the um, early assessment that I have right now, because I'm really working with very, very limited uh, data sources, um, none of whom would really uh, be within the rubric of deep and broad uh, research. Now, in regard to your, I'd like to address your third question in regard to the relationship between the leader and the led. You know, um, we rarely count the tenure of the president in terms of days, but if you count it in terms of days, you're talking 2000 days or thereabouts. There's very little really in the political culture, which is so deeply embedded all around in society that the leader can change unless of course, he resorts to martial law. And even martial law, you know, um, how many years would that be? 1972 up to 1986. That's a fairly long time. Still, the political culture remained the same. People still put government in the center of their political life and you know the dependence on the, the leadership to solve any and all problems is so deeply embedded in that culture. So I doubt if a leader who is there only for 2000 days can in fact change or influence maybe for a brief period of time, but you know, in July, 2022, depending on who will be elected uh, as the new political leader uh, of our country, it will be more of the same thing, you know. So, but um, I'm glad all these things are, you know, are being raised right now. And um, I like what uh, Professor Tehanki had given us many, many frameworks or prisms through which to view um, the political leadership. And I like that you mentioned uh, our colleague, uh, our STEAM colleague, uh, Dr. Agpalo, because uh, July, I think it cannot be denied that uh, Dr. Agpalo moved away from the Western perspectives of, you know, viewing our political leadership from, you know, how Almond and Kalman, et cetera, uh, had viewed our political leadership and was saying that, okay, let's do it from the Filipinos way of viewing it. And thank you very much, Professor Tehanki for introducing that particular perspective. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Carlos. And uh, Sir July, would you like to respond? Yes, I'd like, uh, thank you very much, Nicole. Uh, Nicole 
Professor Curato is uh, quite familiar with uh, the work that uh, Professor Thompson and I have been doing because it has uh, taken us uh, almost a decade to complete it. So <laughs> uh, thank you very much for your insights and your uh, question and your, your reaction. No? I'd like to address your uh, first question regarding uh, 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 a democratic leader. No? And uh, of course, I, I'd like to raise the recent um, uh, turn of events in the United States, no, in, uh, and that can be instructive in how we can uh, imagine a post-populist or post-illiberal reconstruction of democratic institution, no? with the election of uh, uh, President Joe Biden, no? and we are seeing how uh, uh, how illiberalism and populism has actually eroded, no. Uh, the uh, deeply held uh, uh, democratic traditions and institutions in the, in, ironically, no, the the uh, the center of uh, liberal democracy, no, the United States, no, and we are, we are now seeing how uh, President Biden and uh, the Democratic Party is trying to rebuild the institution and trying to reconnect. Uh, uh, democratic institutions and rebuilding the center. Now, this is what I term as rebuilding the political center and trying to bring trust back into institution and the rule of law. And uh, hopefully, uh, this can be instructive on how not only leaders but also uh, uh, the citizenry uh, can act in order to achieve. Uh, the full consolidation of the promise of democracy. And in the Philippines, uh, the reason why we are where we are is because after more than three decades of the promise of uh, liberal reformism of the EDSA revolution, uh, the political elites have failed to consolidate the gains of democracy and deliver on its promise of development. And that's the reason uh, why it has fueled this cynicism, this sense of anger and disappointment. And of course, that was the easy uh, uh, source of fuel for populism and illiberalism that has spawned Duterte. You know? So of course, uh, our colleagues uh, uh, like uh, Professor Contreras have a different take on it, but more or less we agree you know, that it has a, uh, it, it, it had that effect you know, on our polity. Now, um, another point is that, uh, of course, uh, there is this current trend, not only in the Philippines, but worldwide. And most uh, political scientists have no noted, like uh, Dan Slater have noted, of, uh, about the democratic decoupling, no? uh, in which there is a distinction between democracy and liberalism. Uh, usually, we think of the concept of liberal democracy but uh, what we are seeing here is a decoupling of uh, liberalism and democracy in which democracy is being used by populist leaders uh, to, uh, uh, to derive legitimation for their illiberal projects. No? So uh, that is the case right now. No? So uh, technically, the Philippines is still democratic. Why? Because the, the basic requisite of a democracy is you hold the election, you, you know, you have legitimizing uh, uh, institution. And uh, what we're seeing is uh, there is still some semblance of democracy because we still hold electoral democracy. Uh, we have electoral democracy in the Philippines. But uh, there is that attack on liberal institution, on human rights, on media freedom. And eventually, this leads to the autocratization process, which eventually leads to full authoritarianism. No? And we are seeing this all over the world. No? So uh, we are already in that position. So, But uh, next year, uh, there is an opportunity for some political intervention because we're holding another election. No? The question is whether uh, this administration is strong enough already in the challenge to, to reproduce itself, to replicate itself, and have its uh, candidate win, anointed candidate win, th then we can say that it is already in a process of totally repudiating the EDSA narrative. But if he, uh, this administration fails to capture the presidency again next year, 
then it's uh, just like the era populist failed experiment. So that's how I, I see it right now. Okay. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tihangki. Uh, we do have, as we mentioned, we do have a few, quite a few questions sent in by uh, some of our participants. But first of all, I would like to go to uh, Professor Hasegawa. Uh, Professor Hasegawa, uh, you have a question? Yeah, well, thank you very much, uh, Raymond. I'm very much interested in uh, yes, the views of you two professors. I, I think uh, Professor Carlos, uh, this uh, uh, low risk uh, taker, Duterres, it, it's rather interesting to me, uh, to the Japanese and also uh, Professor T. Hankes, uh, you are you are sort of comment on the leadership. Could you both of you tell me what's the difference between Duterte and uh, Trump? You know, uh, President Trump was in fact a very low risk taker. He he divided uh, his own people, and uh, he was uh, rude on his own people. But that's not a strong man. Strong man protects their own people. You don't divide your own people and beat them, huh? I think uh, President Duterte, uh, is he doing that? I, I don't think he's doing that much. Could you comment on, on my on my, uh, on my question, uh, Professor Carlos first, yeah? Thank you, and uh, Tihang, Professor Tihanke. Sorry, Professor Carlos, I think you're on mute. I'm sorry. I go. think, uh, thank you, Professor Sigawa, for your question. I think Trump and, uh, and uh, uh, President Duterte may compare, may be compared on some levels, but not on the low risk, high risk platform of the operational code. Because uh, Trump, from my uh, uh, viewpoint, really played high stakes. He did that for Iran, for North Korea, even for domestic politics. And uh, well, and he lost. Uh, because it's always been like that. I mean, uh, he's the master of the of the the deal, you know. And he dealt all around. He did cashier diplomacy, and I don't think. Um, those kinds of attributes can in fact be seen in the Duterte uh, kind of governance. I link my law risk analysis to the fact that uh, Duterte seems to be winging it all the time. He doesn't want to take an active participant role in shaping, you know, influencing the near, the medium, and the long-term future. And um, so, as I said, um, if we have a content analytic uh, way of um, finding this out and getting a support for this low risk assessment that uh, I have made, um, I think we can, given some time, be able to show this. But yes, I don't think they are, in the same poll, both of them are in the same poll on this thing. Trump is a high risk taker and uh, Duterte is not. Thank you. Okay, yeah. So uh, of course, uh, if, you, if you look at these two uh, political actors from uh, strictly a uh, personal presidential style perspective, definitely they, they are two different uh, political animals, no, they are very different from each other. But if we uh, analyze uh, their presidency from the prism of a discursive, no, institutional analysis, then uh, we can say that uh, uh, they are both populist in the sense that uh, uh, they derive their legitimation and their uh, their political power from uh, an us against them, no. Uh, political narrative no so uh, populism as as understood is a narrative no that divides no uh, uh, between the so-called elite and uh, the weak uh, 
uh, everyday normal people. No, uh, it's ironic that in the United States, a, a billionaire like uh, Trump would uh, would position himself to speak for the weak and the defenseless. No, now in terms of the concept of strongman, strongman here is taken as uh, presidents who transgress. No, the uh, limits and the boundaries of institutional politics no such that uh, they they use the power of the executive the power of the presidency uh, to barrel their way and, and transgress the boundaries of institutional politics and actually we have seen that in the four years of uh, Donald Trump the way he has uh, thrown caution to the wind in terms of uh, ethics and and institutional boundaries in uh, in the United States uh, governance, no, and of course in the Philippines, uh, of course, need I say more, no. So uh, uh, in that sense, no, from uh, that's the reason why there uh, uh, in our work we have also uh, uh, raised the caveat about simply focusing on personal. Uh, actor-centered presidential style in understanding the presidency, but it should be both uh, an agential and a structural and even a discursive uh, combination in order to truly appreciate uh, the Philippine presidency. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Sir Julian. and thank you, Professor Hasigawa for um, that question. Um, we, uh, as I said, we do have quite a few questions, but I'm going to try and summarize some of these questions. A lot of them are related to, uh, or asking your assessments about the this this administration, and um, sort of asking us to provide a kind of a political horoscope of what's going at of what the the, the next presidential elections um, are going to be like. Um, Perhaps uh, if I can go to Professor uh, Carlos first, um, you mentioned about uh, these concepts of uh, democratic deficits and the problems with the broken political parties. Now, one of the questions is um, actually um, when it comes to Duterte's actions on politics and its citizens, like the issues of extrajudicial killings, the media shutdown, um, do you think this signifies uh, that the, the the Philippines and Philippine politics is sort of have uh, sort of has become a flawed democratic state. That is the question for you. And then um, for Professor Tihanki, uh, some of these uh, some of the questions coming in um, uh, here are um, about the liberal values of uh, Filipino society and what its role in uh, uh, in choosing the leader. Um, and also, th does uh, Filipino values and um, the this role of a populism and authoritarianism, these concepts, th does this have a role in Filipinos choosing a leader, in choosing the current leader, and choosing the next leader of the country? And then perhaps if I can post this question for Professor Curato, I think she she provided a, a great assessment of leadership in the Philippines based on um, what Professor Tihanki and uh, Professor Carlos talked about earlier. A uh, question posed through the chat is, how can leaders shape the country's domestic policy given, given the uh, bureaucratic inertia? Because without the grand narrative, pretty much everything becomes transactional. So can we start with um, Dr. Carlos? Yeah, okay, thank you, Raymond, uh, for that, that question. You know, I have uh, many times, I, have, I can't count now how many times I have been interviewed in regard to these extrajudicial killings. And my standard response would be, confront the issue, uh, and, and because for as long as this continues to be a question, and for as long as we prevent uh, independent uh, external actors from coming into the country, it will continue uh, to, in fact, be an issue against his administration and beyond, even beyond, when he no longer has the immunity. And, you know, uh, if the data coming from the external uh, sources um, cannot be matched from data on the ground, I even suggested that you know, academics uh, here, 
uh, may a company, uh, you know, the ICC or whoever would like to investigate this so that there will be no skewing of the observation. So there will be no priming or there will be no uh, minders around that will point you to the uh, uh, confirmation of what the government uh, declares or claims and what the others claim. So it will be really no less than a scientific investigation of what do the data tell you. So we'll keep that open, and uh, but that will continue, I think, to um, be a concern of this administration and beyond. And um, I think that becomes a, a major issue um, uh, also, particularly because one of the ASEAN 10 is being confronted with that with a military junta and with continuing uh, protests in the streets and continuing violence. Again, you have a collision here of the principle of non-interference, which is so sacred in the ASEAN 10, but there is also the counter principle of responsibility to protect. So I think these are all the issues which will collide and which I think not, not only scholars will have to look into because, you know, human life and the uh, human life is precious anywhere, you know, it does not need a particular geography. So it's a continuing concern. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Carlos. And uh, yes, Dr. Tihanki, do you think there is this sort of, uh, do Filipinos really have authoritarian tendencies? And then what is the role of um, uh, political leadership consciousness among Filipinos when it comes to choosing a leader? Well, uh, of course, if you review the literature, uh, social science literature on uh, leadership and authoritarian characteristics, uh, there are those that support that, uh, that culturally, and this is uh, uh, to be found in some works in uh, sociology or even anthropology, that uh, because of our cultural and even geographical uh, uh, location in Asia, that uh, there is that authoritarian uh, uh, characteristics no, in our culture. No? But of course, there have been studies also that have uh, proposed that uh, uh, that is not the case. No? Uh, and there have been surveys that have been conducted not only by the, our local uh, uh, polling uh, uh, institutions, but also uh, uh, international academic projects like Asia Barometer that have, have shown that uh, democratic norms and values have, uh, have deep roots in Philippine society and culture. No? So uh, you have these two perspectives. No? So, uh, one saying that because of our history, our geography, our culture, that we have this uh, authoritarian uh, uh, street, no? uh, that we, we are deferential, there's that uh, 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 natural tendency to obey and all that. But of course, uh, we can argue that uh, also uh, in, in the Philippines, which is the oldest democracy in Asia, we have, uh, we have deep uh, democratic roots. No? But the problem is that democracy is like a plant. No? Democracy needs to be nurtured, needs to be cultivated so that it will uh, deepen its root and that it will uh, uh, blossom no? and so that we can enjoy the fruits of democracy. No? So that's the problem. No? So it's not a static, uh, uh, are we authoritarian or demo democratic? It's a process. No? It's a process. No? And it involves people. And I see a comment about the role of people because oftentimes we focus on leadership. We focus on the big political players. We focus on the big actors. No? But who, where are the people? No? Uh, even in this concept of populism, no? populist leaders uh, pretend to speak on behalf of the people. But do we really hear the people here? No? Do, are they really part of the conversation? No? So uh, that's why I, I also believe in not only uh, representation, but also uh, deliberation and inclusion. No? These are all part of what we call the varieties of democracy. No? These are all elements of democracy that should be part of the process. No? So um, uh, like, for example, uh, was it uh, James Scott who talked about weapons of the week and then Ben Kirk with everyday politics? No? Because we often focus on 
politics from above and oftentimes we forget politics from below no and i think that's the most important aspect and that's why i i i, I am a great fan of what uh, our colleague Nicole Corato is doing no uh, trying to uh, unearth no uh, politics from below Thank you, Sir July. Um, yes, Dr. Kuratop, uh, what do you think about uh, leadership, the role of leadership and the role of leaders um, when it comes to domestic policy because of this uh, bureaucratic inertia, apparent bu bureaucratic inertia? Is it just going to be transactional because of this? Right. I think I begin with a caveat that I'm not a public policy expert. So as Professor Tehanki pointed out, my concern as a sociologist is to zoom in the micropolitics of how everyday forms of governance um, is constructed. And I think from my own work, uh, talking to um, not just local government leaders, but also everyday citizens, what we learn is that the experience of politics at the everyday level um, really matters to institutionalize these reforms, even if we are stuck or to break the bureaucratic inertia. And here I'd like to emphasize the role of everyday democratic labor. So for example, small policies that may seem insignificant can actually make a difference. Think about the case of a local mayor who gave equal slots in a marketplace to all market vendors, regardless whether the market vendors supported the mayor during the last elections or whether they supported the other party. That in itself is such a significant way of changing behavior because it communicates to everyday citizens that actually fairness in governance is possible. Everyone got a slot in the market to sell fish and vegetables, regardless um, of who they supported in the previous election. Um, the consistent enforcement of traffic rules or the regular regularization of casual workers in the city hall may seem insignificant in the greater scheme of things, but these everyday decisions that affect the lives of ordinary citizens demonstrate that reform can actually work and they can actually be made consistent. The question now is how can we scale up these everyday democratic reforms um, that is not just stuck on the level of local governments in cities that are lucky to have progressive leaders and make it work for the entire nation. I think that is still the puzzle because so far the success stories that we know in the Philippines, a big part of it, as Professor Carlos mentioned a while ago, is also fortune or luck, right? Incidentally, a progressive leader was able to mount a campaign in this particular region. And incidentally, the citizens were also uh, deeply active and aware, perhaps because there's a rich tradition of social organizing because of martial law or because of other campaigns. So it's the, it's the intersection of different factors that allows these micro-political reforms um, to happen. So at least from a more yeah, sociological perspective, that's how I would interpret that question. I would look at the everyday micropolitics of how reform is experienced uh, in the lives of ordinary people. Thank you, uh, Dr. Kuraton. Um, I, we only have about five minutes um, for, for, for this webinar. So I'm just going to perhaps give uh, uh, some time for Professor Carlos and Professor Tihanki to, to conclude. Um, if you have any, um, a, a few last words for our audience, Professor Carlos. Yes, um, I think this uh, seminar should be a series. If you will notice, we are racing through time and we are, you know, truncating so many very, very involved uh, thoughts um, and ideas and principles and theories and we're just swimming in them and almost drowning. So I hope Dahlia and Raymond, you can think of this um, later as a series um, because Professor Tehanki can be just the sole lecturer actually. Um, I know that he was going through this very quickly. I was choking myself from all the things that he had to you know, put together because he knew he had a 20 minute limit. And um, so maybe next time um, we need, um, a more democratic uh, <laughs> platform. <laughs> and uh, yes, maybe let's have one main lecturer and one discussant uh, so that they have the full, um, you know, the full play of their ideas instead of us uh, almost choking and so many, many <laughs> things. Actually, I wanted to ask also Nicole and, and July, but you know, there's no. <laughs> 
uh, <laughs> in fact, this should be a continuing conversation. So yes, I hope you will take that into consideration. And thank you for inviting me to be part of this conversation. Yes, definitely, yes. definitely. Thank you, Professor Carlos. Uh, we'll definitely take that into consideration. Um, Sir July? Well, uh, first of all, again, I'd like to thank uh, you uh, and uh, Dahlia for uh, organizing this. And I'm, I'm so happy to be with my professor. And uh, I, I am where I am because uh, she was one of those who trained me. No? So I, I, I give it back to you, ma'am. No? Thank you. I deserve that grade. <laughs> So, uh, uh, yeah, and uh, yeah, thank you, Nicole, also for all the insights. No, uh, this is a continuing conversation, no? and uh, uh, we are part of uh, this process. No, I would just like to end, no, because there's this uh, last point in the chat chat box. No, so uh, does the present flawed elitist democrat demo democracy of our government can be nurtured into a complete or mere perfect democratic society or maybe democracy is not really suited for the Philippines. So I, I guess uh, uh, the one asking this is uh, perhaps a Gen Z or a millennial, I, I'm not sure, no? but uh, my question is, my counter question is, what is our alternative? No? Uh, democracy is an option no? and uh, democracy, no matter how flawed, uh, renders us with our freedom. No? Uh, what is the option? What is the alternative? Is it going back to authoritarianism? I belong to that generation. And you know, this is a boomer or a Gen X argument, no? but I lived through the dictatorship. And you wouldn't want to live under that system. No? So that is something to ponder on. No? Uh, on social media, we see all of these people saying, oh, democracy is good, authoritarian, democracy is not suited for the Philippines. But my question is, what is the alternative? Is it going back to authoritarianism or is it going back to the dictatorship? Well, it's your future, no? It depends, no? <laughs> That's your choice, no? So we've lived through it. We fought against the dictatorship and uh, we were part of this process uh, that have restored, uh, no matter how flawed, democracy. And it is also our fault that we have failed to consolidate it. So it's a challenge to the next generation no, to really reflect on the promise and the potential of the democrat democratic alternative. So thank you again and good afternoon to all. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Tihangki. Um, definitely more questions than answers. So um, hopefully this wouldn't be the last. Now, um, on behalf of the uh, Aikun's Tokyo Liaison Office, the Global Peace Building Association of Japan, Hiroshima University's uh, Network for Education and Research on Peace and Sustainability, and Professor Hasegawa, Professor Simangan, uh, we would like to express our sincerest gratitude to our esteemed panel of experts, Professor Clarita Carlos, Professor July Tihanki, and Professor Nicole Curato for accepting our invitation and for sharing with us their perspectives on the state of Philippine politics, elections, democracy. Uh, this seminar sought to situate the concept of leadership in the landscape of Philippine politics. And um, there isn't a more important time to have this sort of uh, uh, introspection about how Philippine society and government understands and puts this concept of leadership into practice. So we hope that the discussions we had today with our acclaimed panel of academics has contributed to this re uh, reflection. Uh, we would also like to thank everyone who joined us today for this webinar from here in Japan, in the Philippines, and from other parts of the world. Um, I know we do have some unanswered questions from our audience, so we would like to assure them uh, that these will be forwarded to our panelists so that they can uh, try to address the questions and we will try to incorporate them in a report which will be uploaded later online. And speaking I'd of like that, to, uh, uh, yes, Raymond, I'd like to join you and uh, Daria in uh, thanking uh, Professor Carlos and uh, Professor T. Hanke and uh, Nicole. I think you have provided me, us, with a very high level of intellectual discourse. So much appreciated. Thank you.